thank you everyone for coming today to um, see our fourth uh, lecture in the series with our artist Monique. Um, and before I go ahead and turn the, the lecture over to her, um, I just have a quick thing that I have to read off um, from our Pathways Coordinator, Becky Ocampo. So, <clears throat> So courtesy of the Arts Pathway, there will be a raft credits. With your one card, you can purchase items at the bookstore, CCBC cafes, printing, and most campus vending machines. The drawings will be held after the conclusion of the artist talks. So not after today's specific talk, but at the end of the series. Um, and the winners will be notified by email. So just keep an eye out on your email. And just a reminder that registration is open now for winter and spring. So if you haven't registered yet, please meet with an advisor and do so. Okay, and make sure that you know your pathway. And thank you for that, I guess, for we'll return to our regularly scheduled program um, now. And I'll go ahead and turn things over to Monique for our artist talk today. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Um, I always feel like I'm at the control panels and I'm out of control when I when I do the, sh the screen share, so bear with me. Um, but I think it's gonna work this time. Um, uh, okay, so far, so good. Um, here. Okay. Um, Hi everyone, Helito. My name is Monique Verda, and um, I am zooming in today from uh, the the banks of the Lower Mississippi River here in Bulbuncha. Uh, the Choctaw called this place Bulbuncha, uh, meaning place of many languages or place of many tongues, uh, long before the colonizers sailed in to rebrand um, these sacred trading grounds, Nouvelle Orléans, or as we may know it better, New Orleans. Um, I come from a long line of indigenous people who have been living along the, the Gulf Coast um, and am part of the United Homa Nation. And our territories um, of modern day are found in the Yaknishido, the big country that's found between the Atchafalaya and the Mississippi rivers. And this photograph that I'm sharing here, um, you know, I've been thinking a lot about this idea of the archive, um, where we get our, our history, um, how memories are preserved, how stories are told. Um, and this photograph was shared with me by my grandmother um, uh, when I was a girl. She had these five photographs that were on these kind of old postcards. And this photo was taken in the late 1920s in the Yakni Shido. And my two great grandmothers are, are both um, seen here at either side of the front row. Uh, Celestine in the white um, with the little boy has her, his hand on her shoulder. And then Ernestine is on the other side um, holding the baby. Um, and so just want to take a moment to recognize and acknowledge all of our ancestors, mine here in this photograph and yours, um, that have made it possible for us to, to share um, this bit of time and looking forward to the conversation and questions to come, but just wanted to share some, some thoughts and ideas and kind of orient you in this place that I call home. Um, Homa means red in the Muscogee um, language and the Mobilian jargon is what was spoken here in the territory um, when the colonizers first kind of came in. But as the Choctaw called this place, place of many languages, there were many languages that were spoken just within the 100 mile radius of what is modern day New Orleans. Um, there were about seven different languages, seven or eight um, different languages of different nations. Um, but you have to remember that folks were traveling the Mississippi all the way from um, the borders with Canada and coming up from um, Central America as well. Um, and so this, this delta is um, a power point for, for trade and exchange, even to modern days. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, the Homa, the Biloxi, the Shakta, the Shiramacha, the uh, Akola Pisa, the Takapa Ishak, the Washa, Shawasha, and the Shapatulis were all, um, and many other nations were all living here in this territory. 
Um, so just to acknowledge that. And, and here is a photograph that can, uh, or a, a map, I'm sorry, that can help to better orient us. Um, so they say Louisiana is the boot state boot-shaped state, um, but we're losing land at one of the fastest rates on the planet. So the statistic that is thrown around that some scientists roll their eyes at because it's not exactly accurate, but it's the best way we can get our minds around, um, you know, what's happening here. Every hour, a football field of land disappears from the shores here in South Louisiana. And um, if you look here between the Atchafalaya River and the Mississippi River going down is the Bayou Lafayette. Fouche, and that was kind of the lifeline um, and, and, and main source of, of water and of ways of, of connecting these, these web of bayous that's found here in this territory. And South Louisiana is losing land at one of the fastest rates on the planet, and this part of the Yakni Shido is losing land at one of the fastest rates in South Louisiana. Um, so, you know, we've also been up against huge... Um, consequences of extraction here. And this map, um, a dear friend and collaborator, Jacob Rosenzweig, made these maps for us um, for a project called My Louisiana Love, which is a documentary that um, I can share a link to if you're interested in watching it. It's an hour long piece that's on PBS that kind of shows this 100 year story of what's happening from a HOMA perspective and the multi-generational um, perspective. Um, speaking of multi-generations, this is my grandmother, um, Armentine, and, and um, this is one of the first photographs that I, I ever really kind of took. Um, in the late 90s, she took me to the place where she grew up, this place, Pointe aux Chiens, or Point of the Oaks, or Pointe aux Chiens. Um, well, it's Pointe aux Chiens, Point of the Dog, or Pointe aux Chiens, Point of the Oaks. The debate is still out on maps. You'll see it named as different places. Um, but of course, this is in the heart of Yakni Shido. And um, in this image here, which is also in the background right now, because I'm in a, my, our messy shared studio. <laughs> um, but this is a, I've been really kind of fascinated with layering time and data. And so using United States geological survey maps, which are in the public commons, um, and layering them. So using maps from the 1930s um, as a base, and then on top of it, a map from the uh, 2000s, I think this one is from, that's layered on top. And then it, the photograph is a photograph that I took that is uh, in the actual place of the map. Um, so they're all kind of layered. And this is just to show this kind of land loss where you see the squiggly lines that was considered land or trembling prairie really trembling prairie i love that um that word because this was prairie you know we think of swamps and cypress trees and oak trees yes but prairie and this was one of the southeasternmost places that um buffalo would make their their migrations to um, my work is really kind of rooted uh, to this place, which is a kind of a yucky place, um, but also near uh, a community of Grand Bois, which is a historical community for the Homa. Um, but this in the late 90s I learned about and um, is where toxic waste from the oil fields is brought to this site, which is in a flood zone north of um, some of the fastest disappearing land on the planet, just south of the intercoastal waterway, which is a man-made canal. Um, and it, it, they bring this waste there and they treat it by like kind of moving it around. But um, it's considered not, how do they say it? They say it in a funny way. It's like, it's, it's not hazardous, but it has hazardous characteristics. So it can never leave the actual site. So they're just like piling up this, this land here or, you know, dirt treated waste. Um, but this I learned <laughs> as a young woman was a very common situation that's found here. Our kind of landscape is pockmarked by, um, by oil field leftovers, right? And pipeline canals. Hi, sorry. I, um, I'm in this shared space and I didn't know the ant. I'm doing a talk. I'm sorry. I'm, can, I'll be done in an hour, but I'll, take, I'll put my mask on. I'm going to put my mask on, y'all. <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, so, yeah. 
This is um, another image that was taken just near the Grand Bois site. Um, and as you can see, it's a flood zone. So what's in that material, in, in those waste pits, that material comes out um, when we have high water events. And this summer um, has been unprecedented in the amount of hurricanes that we've had. And I know folks have been feeling it as far up into the Northeast. Um, and um, our folks who have are down in Central America who have been just pounded, um, you know, by the storm that came in as a Cat 5 last night, Iota, which is just mind-blowing to think of. Um, but this to just share the landscape, right? Like we've been doing this hyper um, in, infrastructural uh, levy systems. And so um, you can see the wetlands in the back here um, that are just totally disintegrating. And then this levy infrastructure, they call it risk reduction because they can't promise protection, but you know, what's dry and, and what's left outside. And this is a map that is given by our, our officials showing that by 2050, um, what is red will be considered water. Um, so we're up against like huge changes that are happening right now. And this, of course, the web of pipelines. Um, we have over 10,000 miles of canals that have been dredged through our wetlands since the 1930s, contributing to this land loss in addition to sea level rising in the infrastructure to control the Mississippi River as well, um, which of course is contributing and exacerbating the subsidence. So just to go back to these maps, so this is a map from the 1930s. Um, uh, this is the site, uh, same time, same place, 1990s, and this is an elder of mine who has been a great teacher um, and recently passed, Vivian, and she grew up here, and this is a place where oil was first dredged in the wetlands, and I took her there not too many years ago. She wanted to go. I didn't want to bring her because there's just nothing there. It used to be a community, and she got out of the car. She was like, this is our land, but as you can see, you know, the oil canals have just been cut through the marshes, which has just been part of our demise. And this, of course, from the 2000s, um, 2015, you can see this is just open water now in many cases. Um, so I'm just going to kind of flip through here because I really want us to have time to um, have more conversation. But this one community, which is in um, the Yacni Shido, known as Ile de Jean Charles, is one of the first communities that was received a federal grant to relocate because over 80% of the so-called island has disappeared since the 1930s. And again, this kind of layering of time. So um, uh, this is a sign that's in, um, in a resident's front yard, say that we're not moving. And you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, the Ile de Jean Charles, um, which is the little sliver of land there. So they're trying to relocate folks 30 miles inland. But the question is, when you take people away from the bayou side, you're taking them away from their everything, from their way to, um, you know, it's the, their place of like, it's the living room, it's the, it's the place of, <laughs> of celebration. It is also a place where, um, where your whole work and boat and life um, and way to feed yourself depends upon that bayou side. Um, there are, uh, so the Homak are mound, come from mound building culture. Um, and I just, I find it really fascinating. So this photograph here um, is of a mound, a uh, Piku Cemetery, it's known as now, but a 1500 year old mound. And you can also see in that bottom right corner, there's also um, some oil supply tanks there. Um, and, and of course this again, the layering of like two maps on top of each other. So the darker the, um, the water, the, the darker the color, the deeper the water. Um, and what was land now becoming water. And I just think it's interesting that in the 30s, this site is actually marked as an Indian mound. And in 2000 and, um, in 2015, I think is where this other map on top comes from, um, it's just noted as a cemetery. Um, so the significance of places and how things get renamed or erased in the process has been really interesting investigation. So um, I, I just want to share these last maps, and you can actually find them um, on the southerncultures.org website. It's a Cancer Alley essay piece that I put together. Um, and this is uh, 
again, this kind of layering of time. Um, so some of the earliest maps from the United States Geological Survey um, layered again with, um, with more modern maps and, and just telling a story of place and using these kind of historical artifacts to, um, to bring attention to sacred sites like, um, like this place, uh, Menshak Point is what it was known as. And had, again, this kind of mound complex was found there. Um, in the early times of colonization and now is where the Dow chemical plant sits um, and occupies that territory. Um, so they call the stretch of land from the Baton Rouge, which is um, near um, ancestral grounds as well for the Homa, uh, to New Orleans. There are hundreds of petrochemical facilities that can be found there. Um, and of course, this is a major port for the United States, um, um, you know, exporting United States grain, importing a lot of things, um, everything from, from rubber to bananas to um, to steel, um, but then also, you know, we are a power point for the planet in, in another way in that we have been a, kind of an artery uh, for oil and gas for a long time. And some of your oldest and largest refineries are found here on our banks. Um, but also, you know, I always tell people before we had oil and gas, what we had here was cotton, but mostly sugarcane. And so this legacy of the plantation economy and society and ways of being and the injustices that are found along the fence lines um, in our modern days, you know, they, they call it Cancer Alley because it's got a reputation, right? Um, so, uh, but through these investigations with the maps, I've also uncovered other parts of family history on my mom's side um, tied to this like legacy of colonialism and that some of her people were some of the first settlers in the Louisiana territory. So this kind of layering of history is really fascinating um, and always like at the foundation are these extraction of natural resources and how that affects land and lives and labor. Um, so again, like to think about this kind of global connections of that, this is an aluminum facility in Gramercy, Louisiana, where they're taking bauxite from Jamaica, bringing it up to Louisiana. And then here they have this facility, which is like, has this ridiculous mercury emissions. Um, so just another, and then the, some of these illustrations are Duprats, who was one of the first kind of illustrator to come into the territory. And I just find these like records of time um, really interesting. Um, so yeah, um, please check out the Southern Cultures piece because there's a lot more information um, there uh, that can be found if you're interested in petrochemical. <laughs> um, you know, it's 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 quite like overwhelming and um, and also you know to to just to learn of the loss. Um, but also, I think it's important for us to remember how resilient the nature is. That you know, I tell people all the time we should be surrounded by thousand year old cypress trees, um, and we're not because that was the one of the first things that were taken um and and the the taking has just continued um uh over the centuries and we're at a point now where we can no longer ignore the side effects of those consequences and i think it's really important for us to to remember the the natural intelligence of the nature and for us to try to um you know i mean you, you can see like if you give the nature a little bit of what it needs like there's this amazing um ability to to regenerate and to stabilize and to adapt and i think that there's a lot for us to learn there and there's a lot of collaboration that can happen um, between human beings and and the the, the world around us um, this is just a really uh, odd you know it's it's kind of like I, i'm all when i was 19 and i learned about the waste pits and grand bois i was just like oh my god we call ourselves civilized and like this is happening like people are getting lead poisoning and little kids like you know mamas are having to all have like hysterectomies for the same kind of weird growths and little kids have these crazy lead levels, you know, just like, this is absurd. And then I'm like, oh, then I learned like, oh, this is actually really common. You know, this happens all the time in different ways all over the world. Um, 
but just to think about coal, right? And that we're in this delta, this like sinking wetlands. We're surrounded by petrochemical facilities and vulnerable place where hurricanes hit all the time. And then also outside of these, you know, risk reduction levies, there are these coal terminals at the end of the Mississippi River, which just seems totally absurd to me. Um, so yeah, this is just kind of to illustrate that, um, <laughs> that yeah, in a place that was called Deer Ring, that there also is this crazy um, oil or, or coal facility. Um, and I'm sorry, my, my images got kind of backed. I, I think I, yeah, I'm a little bit backwards here. So there you go with my uh, being out of control. <laughs> um, so I, I actually got on the river. So those maps that were created, I had gotten on the river last last no November uh, for 10 day journey and um, seeing the seeing this place from the water, um, which is the life force, you know, I always want to recognize the river for actually giving me the land upon which I call home. Um, and just the power of that river and also, um, yeah, just how it's been taken such advantage of um, was 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 mind uh, blowing and uh, had just kind of flipped my brain upside down and thinking about this place. So just, um, yeah, here's the Southern Cultures Cancer Alley, Estruma to the Gulf of Mexico piece. If you want to check that out, um, please do. And I'm going to try to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I've babbled for about 20 minutes. I sometimes <laughs> Um, like, oh, oh. Um, so yeah, I, there's a lot more, of course, I could say, but maybe we could go ahead and um, open up for conversation and, and Q&A and um, see where that goes. Okay, um, so does anyone have any questions? Oh, okay. Uh, so this one is from Jessica, our intrepid curator. Can you talk more about your process in making these pieces? Are you working digitally? I am. Um, I uh, When I was 18, instead of going to college, I went and worked in a print shop um, in the early days, in the late 90s of like computer technology times. It feels like the stone ages. But um, yeah, <laughs> Photoshop has been a friend for many years. Um, so using some of my own photographs, um, and then finding these archival historical images um, and then collaging things together um, through, through Photoshop. Okay. Let's see, do we have any more questions? Oh, okay, uh, this one's from Emily. How difficult is it for you to find all of these maps and resources? And do you ever find things that surprise you? Yeah, um, I, uh, I'm always finding things that surprise me. And as the, the digital archives continue to expand, um, it's become even more, um, yeah, yeah, fascinating. You know, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the New York um, Public Library digital archives, digital library. Um, there, there's a wealth of knowledge that can be found there. Um, and I was recently part of this uh, archiving seminar where folks from all over the world were talking about archives and I was sharing those maps and folks were like, well, wow, why did you choose those images, some of those images to layer in? And, you know, in some cases it was like, I was just Googling a place. Like I, I would kind of Google like Baton Rouge and then in the creative commons, what comes up is really interesting to find. So, um, yeah, I miss being in libraries, but there is something really lovely about having access to all of this um, public information. And um, uh, yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. So, okay, the next one is from Joni. I love the photo of your grandmother. Can you tell us a bit, bit more about her? Yeah, um, so my grandmother, uh, Armentine, was, as I was saying, Vivienne um, was an elder who was a great teacher of mine. Of course, my grandmother was like my master teacher in so many ways. Um, she lived to be 101 um, and passed in 2016. But, you know, she, um, if you check out My Louisiana Love, our documentary, which uh, she was a core collaborator um, in creating, 
that piece, um, you know, you can learn much more about her, but she, you know, she was a woman who never received a formal education and being able to, you know, learn how to read and write, um, this kind of six, it's a, it's really a seventh, 17th century French um, that has been mixed with the Muscogee sentence structure, um, which is the Homa French that our elders are, speak. Um, that was her first language. Um, and they say that she really didn't start speaking English well um, or better the, until the 80s. Um, you know, and part of that was because we were together a lot and I would speak to her in English and she sometimes would speak to me in French and then she gave up um, at a certain time. And that's kind of been something I regret. But um, yes, very strong person. I mean, and up until her 90s was like working in a garden and super faithful and rode out hurricanes and little p rows which are these flat bottom canoes <laughs> you know she's um she had mom of seven you know mother of many more kind of woman um who is an incredible rock um and taught me a lot about just you know um yeah how to live with the land and how to respect um yeah the gifts of of nature so i'm I feel really blessed to have had a relationship with her and for so long um and and spent the last couple of years of her life with her helping to to yeah care for her which that was a huge lesson um caretaking is no joke <laughs> um so yeah wow well i can't imagine riding that a hurricane in that wow that's a <laughs> strong lady wow um okay let's see so Next question is from Jessica. Um, could you talk about your memory seed bank project? Uh, students in my art history class, please ask some questions. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, the land memory bank and seed exchange really uh, was born out of uh, this project called Cry You One, um, which I can share the link to that too in the chat. Um, Cry You One. This is kind of multi-dimensional, part performance, part procession, storytelling uh, experience that premiered in my community in St. Bernard Parish in 2013. Um, and at that time, I have this geodesic dome, um, which is 16 foot in diameter. We covered it in palmettos, so it looked like a traditional Homa structure from the outside and then people would come in and there was this whole other world on the inside um, with like transparent photographs woven into this uh, material that created almost like a stained glass effect. Um, and there were groups of 15 that would come into this space and I would share a seed of um, button bush, which is a great plant for purifying water. And, um, and I would share a story and then I would tell them, you know, you go this way or I don't know. Um, See you at the end. <laughs> um, and it was like a total commitment for folks. It was really amazing. So um, so the that experience, I just recognized how powerful it was to gather people together um, and to create space for for being able to talk about, you know, where we are in these times here in South Louisiana and to see what comes up organically too, like what stories people want to tell, what people know, what people don't know, what, what you know, what gets shared in those spaces. And so um, in 2015 is really when the Land Memory Bank kind of caught its own wind um, and started to activate in these spaces, specifically at this cultural center, which is uh, Los Isleños Cultural Center. So Isleños are Canary Islanders who came over to Louisiana in the late 1700s when the Spanish had control of the territory. Um, but it also is a multicultural space. There's also, you know, Louisiana is incredible in that, like, it's the diversity of, you know, Canary Islanders, Filipinos, um, Italians, Irish, of course, the French and the Spanish, and Indigenous folks, too. Um, so, you know, just being able to, like, share seeds. We share a lot of pollinator seeds, but then to create these spaces for stories to be told. And then also, in recent times, have been doing more events, um, 
uh, in the social world. So um, actually tonight we have an event called Botanica, which have been a series of conversations that the Land Memory Bank has been holding, um, hosting with different folks, um, talking about plant medicine knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's always shifting and changing, but this kind of preservation and sharing of native and um, indigenous traditional pl plants for medicine and food um, has been a, a, a goal of that, as well as collecting these kind of untold stories, um, which is starting to gain more wind now. It's been a lot about the plants and, and just holding space um, for a long time. So, yeah. Cool. Um, okay. The, I do have a, I have a question um, personally, and then, then I'll ask. So the Botanica, is there a way for anyone to view that um, event? Sure. Yeah, I'm gonna um, I'm going to share the there's a event page um, for our Facebook, and I'll share some other links too that cool. I was talking about for folks. Um, yeah. yeah, it'd be interesting to to see some more. Um, Okay, so now that my question's answered, sorry guys, I've popped in there. Um, let's see. Okay, um, from Emily. Was there a particular moment or event that made you want to integrate making art and talking about the environment? Um, so I think that it really was, you know, learning about my cousin's fight with, with the, those pits that I was share the, the waste pits. Mm -hmm. Um, I was 18, you know, I, I, I really didn't know anything about land loss and I hadn't really thought too much about oil and gas too at that point in time. Then I was just like horrified, um, and wanted to tell that story to make it stop, you know, was my intention. And then I realized that like, the more I learned, the more I realized that it wasn't just like this one place that it, it was like the whole coast of Louisiana was going. And so then it was like, oh, you know, just kind of this like, and still to this day, I'm still like, feel like I'm always learning something new, you know? And I think that with each disaster has come this kind of <laughs> awakening. Um, but I think, you know, the, the reality is around climate change and the climate crisis, like that's kind of at the core of, of what I've been wrestling with and why I've been wanting to use art making as a vehicle to a vehicle to try to expose the truth and for folks to connect that like, oh, um, maybe that's not my problem, but it is, you know, it, it all kind of comes back to us in different kinds of ways. Um, we're just on the front lines here, kind of waving the flag of warning, you know, that, that, that it's the water's coming in my door now and it, your door next, kind of um, metaphorically speaking, and, and in some cases, right. actually, yeah. Um, let's see, next question is from Joanne and she would like to know what is the name of your family's tribe? Um, so I come from the United Homa Nation, and uh, as I was kind of blabbing about, um, you know, Homa uh, means red, and so the there I've been learning more recently about it. You know, as you're, I'm always just like, oh my god, I can't believe. You know, I was like, it was three years ago before I learned that the real name of my home place was Bobuncha. I had always been told it was New Orleans, you know, it's one of these things where you're like, what? Um, and so, yeah, for the Homa, you know, I think that um, part of the history that I've been learning more about is just the I, this idea of the shatter zone. So in the early 1700s, you had these slave raids that were happening, uh, English, uh, English, folks were paying Chickasaw warriors to raid um, villages of different uh, nations in the southeast. And so as a result, you had a lot of um, migrations, forced migrations of, um, and not to mention, of course, you know, on top of the slave raids that folks were being infected by smallpox and other diseases that they were not um, accustomed to. And so you have this kind of scattering of folks um, and places like Mobile um, in Alabama and also uh, what was 
what is west of the Mississippi River in that Yakni Shido um, was considered, you know, similarly to like the Seminoles, right, going deep into the swamps of the Everglades, you had the same thing happening all over, but happening here in the Mississippi Delta. So, you know, as long as you're off the high ground of good earth, people usually generally leave you alone. Um, the United Homa Nation has one of the longest standing relationships with the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which is, of course, under the Department of the Interior, which the Department of the Interior was completely created to force Indian removals, which happened in the 1830s. Um, even though we have one of the longest relationships with the United Homa Nation, we have been denied federal recognition. Um, and in my opinion, you know, I think that us getting uh, federal recognition will be really complicated. And one of the big reasons for that in modern times is that um, oil and gas has been lobbying against our getting federal recognition because, as I like to say, our current territories are on top of black gold mines where oil and gas was found. Um, and of course, you know, our ancestors, my grandmother's mother and her, even herself, um, were pushed off of the lands that we were pushed to. <laughs> um, uh, and when oil and gas was found there, because what was considered undesirable was suddenly very desirable um, with the discovery of, of black gold, oil and gas awful. Um, okay, so next question is, among all the projects you've done so far, which one would you consider to be your favorite and why? That's a good question. I like that one. Um, no, I mean, I love them all in different ways. I think that um, there's a part of me that you know, wrestles with kind of this telling of a personal story in order to like expose a bigger truth to bring people's attention to things. Um, and my collaborators will, 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 you know, attest to like how difficult I have been in those moments, especially with my Louisiana love, which I just shared, which I always like to say that I did not intend to like, have the camera be turned on me to like expose all of these intimate details of my life. But, um, you know, in the process, I realized the power of, of being able to be vulnerable and to share with folks so that they can really like see and hear and feel connected to, um, you know, I wanted folks to walk away from my Louisiana love knowing why Louisiana mattered and like that oil and gas, <laughs> you know, like all of these facts, um, which are really important. Um, but yeah, the personal narrative helps to get people to be like, oh, wait, um, you know, so uh, I, I mean, I think the most surprising for me was Cry You One, which I had never worked in a, um, I had never worked in theater before. Um, and I had just finished my Louisiana love and I was like, I am never going to work in a collaboration ever again. Cause it was so hard, you know, to be with my best friend who's the director and then our editor, it was just like, Arr. and then suddenly I was working on this project with like 20 other people in the swamps of Louisiana. And, um, and it was amazing just the magic of collaboration, you know, that you like, what you can do in your own little world can be great and fine. Um, but like just what gets elevated when you're able to, to really work in, um, in a partnership with other folks, it's, it can be so unexpected and totally love that um, magic of the imagination too. And that was the last question I have. Does anyone have anything additional to ask? Okay, I'm not seeing anything. Um, oh, nope. Okay, so those are additional links. Uh, that's me. Yeah, I just was sharing <laughs> the Cry You One link, which has it's like a whole other world. Mm -hmm. Um, the My Louisiana Love and then the Botanica. And just to say too that, um, you know, I find, I found myself feeling comfortable as like a record maker and a storyteller. Um, but I think that, you know, what has really um, been exciting for me is just um, 
my relationship with plants and medicine plants and learning more about the plants recently. Um, and so, you know, I'm currently working with the Women's Environmental Climate Action Network. Um, and I'm uh, helping to support a, um, a number of different indigenous gardeners, um, women also non-binary individuals across the Gulf South to set up, um, yeah, greenhouses and also to support garden systems for um, traditional and medicinal plants, um, knowing that food sovereignty is everything. You know, the reason why the Homa were able to dodge the Trail of Tears and didn't end up in Oklahoma um, is because they were able to, to find a sense of sovereignty in these wetlands um, because they had food security. So in these times of climate change, we're definitely um, double downing on um, trying to, yeah, be in deep relationship with each other and with our um, traditional territories and also some territories that some of us are not so traditional to, but also can be safe places where we can store seeds um, and have backups. Um, and I see that there's a question. Uh, How has the current condition affected your work? Um, you know, <laughs> the current condition of like COVID, um, I, I've had so much more work talking <laughs> than ever before, um, which I think is good. I think that like having hyper local and regional and national and international dialogues are really important during these times of um, just, you know, th there's just so much that um, we are are going to be up against, I feel like, in, in the coming times. Um, so, so that's been great. And, um, but also, you know, trying to find, um, yeah, trying to find, like, <laughs> what are those adaptation um, uh, experimentations that are necessary? So I'm also working with um, other individuals right now on a float lab, um, some HOMA uh, boat builders who work in the oil field actually as welders have created this, um, I think of it like a blank canvas. It's like eight foot by, by 15 foot. And then we're, we're trying to build it out so that it can be used in ways to like experiment with powering solar motors to um, can we do some agriculture and water? Um, can we use it for performances, um, both on water, off water? Can we use it as exhibition space? Like how do we live with water here? Um, has been a new like exciting, exciting project. project. Cool. Um, okay, from Maya, what have you been working on recently and how does it relate to the story you're trying to tell your viewers? Um, so I think the float lab is a perfect example um, of, of just wanting to lean into solutions more. I feel like I've been, you know, that story of Chicken Little, like the sky is falling. I'm like, the land is sinking, the oil is coming. You know, like I feel like I've been that person for a really long time. Um, the injustice is overwhelming, <laughs> um, which all of that is true. And I'm still like, trying to share that and like help people to understand that like like the the pandemic all the problems that have come with the pandemic they didn't happen because of the pandemic right like they've been there for a long time um so i think that's important for us to like look at time in that kind of way um but i think it's also you know time to to like find a bit of joy and like what is possible um, I work as a collaborator also with a um, collaboration called Another Gulf is Possible. So there's a network of folks from Brownsville, Texas to Pensacola, Florida, who are working towards um, building just transitions. Um, so, you know, the float lab is one example. We also have another project called Cisterns for water catchment. Um, um, and then also I'm part of the Ocean Memory Project, which is, a, and I love like interdisciplinary, just this like to underscore like collaborations and interdisciplinary connections. They're just like the most exciting parts of my, my world right now. And so, you know, learning from ocean scientists um, and thinking about the 
ocean and thinking about water in ways that I think we haven't given enough respect to and um, and recognizing that like the ocean is the ultimate regulator. Um, so yeah, like that's really fascinating and exciting world for me and, um, and using storytelling um, all along the way to just kind of, yeah, there's like all, well, I'm always like scrapping whatever tools I have to like do whatever, whatever it is I'm doing. I'm always, I feel very reactionary. Uh, I feel like my work is very reactionary, but it's now long-term, you know, I've been doing this stuff for like 20 years. So um yeah finding the like solutions and and even if like in the process it's like you face ultimate failure I think it's like having fun and letting people know that like you know it's one of those weird things where it's like oh you know somebody had to imagine that you could like get into a plane and fly and you know that didn't happen for a long time so I think it's important for us to just imagine and experiment and believe and maybe fall on our faces or sink in the mud but you know at some point in time like that dream can become a reality so um i have one question also i just um would like to ask so about the collaboration you said you really enjoyed especially when it becomes interdisciplinary um how critical do you find collaboration in your work like do you find that it, it really spurs you on more and has it changed your thought processes when you've worked with other folks in different disciplines or um, how much does that cross-pollination really influence how you go forward? Yeah, um, I think it challenge, I think that the challenge of like having to look at things differently, you know, when you have a collaborator and if you're really going to listen to them, like they, tr they force you to like, and, and sometimes it's like in this hyper personal way, you know, being like, ooh, okay, um, you see that? <laughs> um, so I just finished um, earlier this year, we released a new book, uh, Return to Yakni Shido, Homo Migrations, with the Neighborhood Story project and my collaborators is really brilliant woman Rachel Runlin who is a cultural ethnographer here in New Orleans been working for a very long time here and um, you know I think it's just like constant learning where and I, I you know I have to credit Rachel a lot in that um, a lot of my like personal storytelling has been to tell a really specific story and like keep into the line because like you can't you know like if you're writing an essay, you can't tell them like blah, 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 all the things, right? You have to like keep it so the po people can stay focused. And so in some cases, you know, I understand that, but in a lot of cases it's like, well, that's not the whole story. Like it's so much more complex. Um, and I think that, you know, especially for Southeastern indigenous peoples that our survival has been so dependent upon adaptation and in many cases we've ha that adaptation has been to be absorbed into a culture of whiteness or in a place like south louisiana to be absorbed into the culture of blackness and that you know segregation has forced these like cho chosen identities for survival right um and you know just the, the the example being that rachel was like you know it's okay to be complex like it's all right actually it's more interesting to expand the truth than to like tr tell this super specific story and as a storyteller you know i I think I, I go both ways um, and in and, and doing that always kind of, you know, it's like, what are the choices that you choose? What do you choose to put in and what do you choose to take out? And even in my manipulation of these like maps, you know, it's a map, like just my friend Jacob, who's a map maker, you know, he told me a long time ago, he's like, the map is not accurate. It's just a representation, you know, which is like, well, that's like everything in life, you know, like, and it can always be like manipulated and distorted and twisted and, you know, um, but like, how can you make people feel the truth or how can you inspire people to seek it out themselves, even if it's for them to prove you wrong? Um, I think that that is really, um, that can be really like where people grow or learn or are able to like see it differently. Awesome. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And um, 
I don't see any more questions popping up. So I think we'll go ahead and, oh, nope, oh, okay. That was my screen moved. All right. Um, so on that note, we're going to go ahead and close off today's uh, Q&A session or discussion. Um, please, uh, ladies and gents, everyone in the audience, if you like, uh, Monique was kind enough to share those links with us. Um, so feel free to go ahead and check them out for further information. And um, thank you again. I hope you all have a really great rest of your day. Okay. Thanks so much. Take care. <laughs> Bye.